um, in our upcoming events here for now. But we're making our way through uh, the book of Acts. So if I could ask you now to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 9, that's where we're going to be tonight. Acts chapter 9, and we'll be picking it up in verse 10. Uh, before we do that, I just want to quickly just catch us back up to where we left off last week. Um, this is oftentimes helpful for anyone who wasn't here or unavailable to watch it online. Um, but last week we took a look at the first nine verses of this chapter, and what we saw was one of the greatest conversion stories in the Bible. We learned that the church had been scattered throughout the region as a result of this great persecution that had come upon the church. And a big part of that persecution, we learned, was at the hands of a Pharisee named Saul. Now, Saul had thought that by exterminating the Christians and destroying the church, uh, he was actually helping God. Um, he thought that he was doing what was right in the eyes of God by doing these things. Well, the gospel message had spread pretty far by this time. Uh, every location the saints were scattered to, they preached the good news of Jesus. And one of these areas was a place called Damascus, which was uh, around 100 miles or so uh, northeast of Jerusalem. Well, Saul decided he was going to go to Damascus to continue his hunt for these people who called themselves the way. But first, he needed to go to the high priest Caiaphas and get authorization to capture and drag back any Christians he found in the synagogues or the homes out there. Of course, Caiaphas, the high priest, well, he didn't have any problem authorizing that. He gave Saul letters to go to Damascus with the authority of the high priest. So Saul and a few of his companions packed up. They headed out towards Damascus, and it was on that road that led them to Damascus that Saul, well, Saul met Jesus. We're told that a light shone all around him from heaven. And later in Acts, Saul explains that this event happened around noon, and the light that blinded him was brighter than the sun. We're told that Saul immediately dropped to the ground, and a voice spoke out to him. A voice that only Saul could understand. It was the voice of Jesus. And the blindingly bright light is surely the light of Christ's glory. The Lord asked Saul a simple question. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then he told him, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. You see, Jesus had a plan for Saul's life, just like he has a plan for every Christian's life. And it was a plan that existed before the foundations of the world. But God also created us with that free will to reject God's plan for our lives. Saul had been rejecting God's plan for quite some time. He had been kicking back against those sharp, painful goats. But we see Saul, he cried out from the dirt, Lord, who are you? And Jesus said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. It was at that moment, at Saul's lowest point, that Saul completely and wholeheartedly believed that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God and is the promised Messiah. And Saul did something that we must all do to avoid the pain of those goats. He stopped kicking them. He completely <coughs> surrendered his life to the will of Jesus Christ. He responded to the Lord by asking him, What shall I do? And the Lord commanded him to get up, go into the city, and you'll be told what to do next. And so Saul rose off the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he was blind. He couldn't see a thing. And his companions actually had to lead him by hand into the city. And once there, the Bible tells us that Paul did not eat or drink for three whole days. And so that's where we left off. And we pick the story back up now, beginning in verse 10. And this is what we read. It says, Now, there was a certain disciple at Damascus 
named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise, and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, so that he might receive his sight. So we're introduced to a new person here, a man by the name of Ananias. Not Ananias and Sapphira, remember? He, he, he got died, he died and got buried. And not Ananias the high priest. Uh, this was uh, a very common name in those days. This Ananias is obviously a Christian man um, because we're told that he was a certain disciple. His name means God is merciful. And later in Acts, in chapter 22, verse 12, Paul tells us that this Ananias was a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. So this tells us that Ananias was not only a Jewish man, but at one point in time he was a devout man according to the law. So he practiced Judaism. But here in our text in Acts, Luke tells us that this same Ananias was now a disciple of Jesus Christ. Well, the Lord spoke to Ananias in a vision one evening, and the Lord called his name Ananias. And I love his response to Jesus calling him. It's at the end of verse 10 there, and he responds to Jesus saying, Here I am, Lord. What a great attitude to have. What a great Christian characteristic to possess. Jesus calls his name and he says, Here I am, Lord. You know, the Bible tells us that those are the kind of men and women that the Lord is looking for. Uh, those with the attitude of, Here I am, Lord, when Jesus calls upon them for something. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. No doubt the Lord would show himself strong on behalf of Ananias because Jesus was going to ask Ananias to do something that would take great courage and boldness from this loyal disciple. And it would be the Lord who would enable him to do what he was called to do. But Ananias possessed one thing God truly desires in a man or woman. A heart that's loyal to him. Here I am, Lord. And what was it that Jesus called him to do? Well, we're told in verses 11 and 12 that he was to get up and to go to a certain street, which by the way still exists today, to a certain house and lay hands on and pray for a man. And this man was an enemy of Christ, an enemy of the church, a man who was well known for dragging Christian men and women out of their homes, Saul of Tarsus. But what an amazing thing we see here. And may we be a church made up of the disciples with an attitude like Ananias. A church that when the Lord calls on us, as a whole or as individuals, we respond to Christ's calling in the same way. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Because Jesus often calls us to certain things, certain tasks. And oftentimes they may not make perfect sense right away. They may be things that are difficult, things that are intimidating. We see here Jesus called on a disciple to go and pray with a man that seemed too far gone to be helped. A man who tried to purposely destroy the church. And sometimes as we're going through our day, the Lord will put something on our hearts, something he wants us to do. Now we can use our free will and ignore it, kick back against the goals, or we can say, okay, here I am, Lord. 
Maybe the Lord's been calling you to something lately. Maybe to pray with someone that seems unkind, unbelieving. Maybe he's asking you to pray with someone that's even persecuted you or hurt you. Maybe there's just one person he's been putting on your heart to share the love of Christ with. To share Jesus with. Ananias was a here I am Lord kind of disciple. And the Lord, as we'll see, did something truly amazing to him. We're told that Ananias was instructed to go to the house of Judas. Now this isn't the bad Judas. This isn't Judas Iscariot. But it was there at this Judas's house that Saul of Tarsus was at. We know he hadn't eaten, he hadn't drank in three days. And we see in verse 11 that Jesus says Saul was there praying. And that's really neat when you think about it. Um, because not only did Jesus know exactly where Saul was, but he knew exactly what Saul was doing. And the same goes for every one of us. Yes. King David himself, a man after God's own heart, wrote about this in Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4. He says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. Now, that can either be a tremendous comfort, or it can be something terrifying. <laughs> For the Christian who's in the will of God and has the here I am Lord attitude, it's a comfort when Jesus is watching your every move. But, for the Christian who's living in sin or not being the man or woman God called them to be, then it could be an uncomfortable thing knowing that God's watching your every move. But that's what we see here. Jesus was watching Saul. He knew the exact address to the house he was in. And he knew exactly what Saul was doing. He was praying. And as Saul was praying, we the Lord gave him a vision. A vision of Ananias coming in and laying his hands on Saul, praying for him. And Saul receiving his eyesight back. That's the vision the Lord gave to Saul. And when I was reading this section and studying it, I, I couldn't help but see God's great mercy here. When you think about it, Saul, he had just found out that he was responsible for killing the followers of the Messiah. He found out that he himself had rejected the Messiah. That everything he had worked for in Judaism was a loss. He hadn't eaten, he hadn't drank, he was hungry, he was thirsty, he was blind, he was in the dark with all this going on in his mind. Could you imagine the torment? Could you imagine the heartache? But what does Jesus do? Does Jesus let him sit there and suffer? No, Jesus gave him hope in the midst of his suffering. He gave him a vision, a vision that his eyesight would be restored. Jesus didn't have to do that, but it shows the great love of Christ he has for even the chief of sinners. He gives us hope in the midst of our suffering. He always does. He always will. And so after the Lord instructs Ananias to go pray for Saul, we read in verse 13, Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here, he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. And so Ananias is obviously referring to letters Saul got from Caiaphas in Jerusalem that authorized him to capture and imprison all the Christians he found in Damascus. But what is Ananias doing here? Is he accusing God? 
No. Is he challenging God's authority? No. Is he questioning God in a disrespectful way? No. No. He's simply getting clarification from the Lord. Okay, there's some people that beat Ananias up right here, but I'm not one of them. He's getting clarification from the Lord. He's willing. Here I am, Lord. You know, I'll do this. But he's also clarifying. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes people think that asking God questions is a bad thing, but it's not. There's nothing wrong with asking questions if the intent of your heart is right when you're asking them. Okay? There's nothing wrong with asking the Lord for confirmation when you feel He's leading you to do something. To move a certain way. Because there's many people who think the Lord is calling them to do something and so they do it without really seeking Him. And they find out very quickly, quickly that it wasn't the Lord, it was their flesh. And that can be disastrous. You know, I've seen it happen. I just feel the Lord's calling me to go here and do this. And then you find out two years later, they're divorced. He's turned into an alcoholic. You go this, go, they don't go to church. You know, you find out on and on, but it's the Lord that called them to that. And so, getting clarification from the Lord is very important. And so Ananias says, here I am, Lord. But he also voices his concerns. Lord, are you sure? Because this man is known for harming your followers. And, and he also has a letter from the high priest to arrest anyone who calls on your name. Am I to go to this guy? Verse 15. But the Lord said to him, go. <laughs> go. And then Jesus graciously tells him why. For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. <clears throat> what we just read is the calling God had placed on Saul's life. But I want to start by drawing your attention to the words chosen and vessel. The first word chosen is a word that has caused division in many churches. Um, some will say if you're chosen, you have no free will to walk away from that choosing. Um, and others reject the idea of election and predestination. But the Bible clearly teaches that God does in fact choose men and women. And men and women can in fact reject God's call. Again, He didn't make us robots. He didn't force us to accept Christ. He didn't wire us to where we couldn't reject Christ. Because every man and woman will come to a fork in the road. And one way leads to everlasting life through faith in Jesus Christ. And the one leads to a very real place called hell through the rejection of Christ. And many times people will wonder whether or not they've been chosen by God. How do I know I've been chosen? Well, put your faith in it and you'll find out for sure. But you won't know until you do. You see, Jesus didn't go to the cross for some. He went to the cross for any man or woman who desires to put their faith in Him. Amen. For Him to be the Lord of their life. The idea that a man or a woman could cry out to Jesus and believe in Him with their whole heart and Jesus reject them because they weren't chosen is absurd. That would mean that God created some people just to feel the fires of hell. But the text clearly shows and teaches us that Saul was chosen and that every Christian was predestined. Actually, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul is writing to Christians and he says this. He says, just as he, speaking of God the Father, chose us in him, God the Son, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy 
and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So you see, those very verses speak of being chosen by God in Christ to be holy and without blame. And it says we're predestined to be adopted as sons and daughters by Christ himself. But we also see scriptures like John 7, 37, which says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus himself stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. The key words are, anyone come to me. So we don't take sides. We don't reject election or predestination because the Bible does teach it. And we also don't agree with the doctrine of limited atonement or the irresistibility of grace. Either way, our text tells us that Saul was chosen by the Lord. And he was chosen to be a vessel. That's the next word I want to look at. Like all Christians, we are all called to be vessels. That word vessel here in the Greek is the word skevos. It speaks of a clay jar. Actually, it's the same word that is used in Psalm chapter 2, verse 9, and elsewhere in the Bible, uh, which speaking of Jesus, it says, You shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. That word vessel in the psalm is the same Greek word used in our text in Acts. Saul had been chosen by God to be a vessel, like a potter's vessel. God would shape and mold him and fill him with his spirit. The only problem was that Saul of Tarsus was a vessel that was already filled. He was filled with himself. We looked at the scriptures last week of Paul's achievements. He was a Pharisee. He was full of zeal. He was circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin. Blameless, according to the law. Sat under the teaching of Gamaliel. The list goes on and on. He was a man that, that knew it. He was full of pride. He was a vessel that was full of himself. And although we don't read of Saul riding on a horse on the road to Damascus, he certainly was knocked off of his high horse by Christ that day. Because one of those things we saw happen on the road to Damascus was the Lord emptying Saul of himself. The Lord took that vessel full of pride and he emptied it so that vessel could be filled with his spirit. Because see, as long as Saul looked at himself as something, he couldn't be used by God for anything. He had to have a true view of himself, and that took an emptying. And like Saul, each one of us are chosen vessels, vessels that are filled with the treasure, guys. The gospel of Jesus Christ. But sometimes the Lord has to empty us of ourselves so that we can be filled with Him. And sometimes that's a painful process. That's why we need to be humble men and women of God. Over and over, that's in the Bible. Pride comes before the fall, right? Humble men and women of God, full of the Spirit. Let's look at what Saul was called to do. In verses 15 and 16, we see two things. Bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So, really two things. Bear my name and suffer for my name's sake. In order for Saul to bear the name of Jesus, it would include bearing the name of Christ before Gentiles, and kings, and the children of Israel, the Jews. 
and this will require a great amount of suffering on Saul's behalf. And sometimes God calls us to hardship and suffering, guys, to accomplish his purposes. But notice, Saul was chosen as a vessel to bear Jesus' name to the Gentiles. This is the first mention of the gospel being taken to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus said, You will be my witnesses, or witnesses unto me, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth, speaking of the Gentile nations. And so in the first nine chapters that we've gone through so far, we've seen the gospel, the witness in Jerusalem. We've seen it in Judea. We've seen it in Samaria. Remember who's in Samaria? Throwing it out there. Philip the Evangelist, right? And now we're seeing it go, the start of it going to the ends of the earth with Saul. Okay, to the Gentiles. Take a look at verse 17. It says, And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. <coughs> Ananias is obedient to Jesus' instructions. And he goes to the street called Straight, to the house of Judas, and there was Saul. Hungry, thirsty, and blind. And suddenly he felt the touch of someone upon him. And I love the words of Ananias here. He doesn't say, Saul, you dirty dog. He doesn't say, Saul, you persecutor of the church. Saul, I'm glad you're blind. You deserve it. No. He says, Brother Saul. Brother. This great enemy of the church. This enemy of Christ who had a reputation that struck fear in the very hearts of Christians is now being called brother by one of those he struck fear in. I love that. And it has a special place in my heart. Um, guys, I'm covered with marks of my past in the form of permanent ink. You know, things I'm not proud of today ungodly things permanently drawn on me for everyone to see. They speak to who I was. But because of who I am in Christ, you guys call me brother. That's an amazing feeling. I could only imagine how Saul felt. The intense spiritual battle that was going on within him as he sat there blinded for three days. And how comforting it must have been to have someone put their hands on his shoulders and say to him, Brother, I'm here for you. I'm here to help you right now. And that's showing the love of Christ. Big time. And I pray that we continue to do the same thing that we see here. That we can overlook people's past mistakes and realize that the moment that they put their faith in Christ, they've been adopted into God's family. And they are now a brother or a sister. They're your brother or sister now. They aren't identified by their past. Their identity is in Christ. And so Ananias lays hands on Paul and we're told at once Saul received his sight back and something like scales fell from his eyes. I don't know what that looked like. The Bible doesn't say. 
He says something that looked like scales fall from his eyes, but I can tell you what it means. The blinders came off. Not only was Saul cured of his physical blindness, but more importantly, he was cured of his spiritual blindness. Now that Saul could see the truth, spiritually see the truth, he could go forth and share that truth and bear Jesus' name. Well, after Paul received his sight, we're told he was baptized. And so the story of Saul's conversion from Judaism to Christianity is an amazing picture of really what Jesus does in each one of our lives. When we take that measure of faith, no matter how great or small, whatever measure of faith God's given you, when we place it in Christ, by God's grace and His mercy, those who are in Christ have had that spiritual blindness healed. And like Saul, we're all chosen vessels. And God has a plan for each one of us, guys. Some of us, God will use in ways that seem mightier than others according to a human viewpoint. But I want to point this one thing out as I'm closing now. When you look at guys from the Bible like Peter, John, Paul, the evangelist Philip, they were vessels used by God to speak to and lead thousands upon thousands of lost people to Christ. And we can think, man, you know, I'll never be used by God like that. Now, I'm no Paul, I'm no Peter, you know. We can look at some of the giants of the faith in our own time. Man, I'm no Chuck Smith, I'm no Billy Graham, I'm no Gregory, right? These were men who were used mightily by God in a very public way. But what if I told you that Ananias was used in just as mighty of a way? That what Ananias did was just as important as all these other giants of the faith. Ananias was used by God to speak to, pray for, and help one man. Not thousands, just one tired, blind, hungry, and thirsty man. Not from a pulpit or in a stadium of thousands of people, but one broken man in the corner of a tiny house. And that one man that Ananias was called to go to went on to be, in my opinion, the greatest apostle ever. He referred to himself as the least, but he was the greatest. That one man went on to spread the gospel to the lost world on a scale that even Billy Graham couldn't touch. He shared it with kings, to the Gentiles, to the children of Israel. And here we are, thousands of years later, and people still read the words of this one man, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and they put their faith in Jesus Christ. Ananias was just a certain disciple. He wasn't an apostle. He didn't walk with Jesus for those years. He wasn't used at Pentecost. And what Jesus called him to do probably didn't seem like anything important. Go pray for this mean old guy in Judas' house. He was just a certain disciple that was obedient to the Lord to go to one man. A man that no one ever thought would be anything or do anything in the kingdom of God. And God took that one man and turned the world upside down with him. Oftentimes we may look at someone and think they will never come to Jesus. Why bother? They'll never accept Christ. That one family member, that one co-worker, that one new guy or gal with all the tattoos that showed up at church one day. <laughs> but here's the thing. 
You never know if that one person that you never thought would do anything for Jesus will be used by the Lord to lead countless peoples to Christ. And it all started with this certain disciple saying, Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. I want to close now by reading this to you. In 1855, there was a Sunday school teacher by the name of Edward Kimball. And on April 21st, Mr. Kimball led one of his students in his class to faith in Christ. Little did he realize that that student by the name of Dwight L. Moody would go on one day to become the world's leading evangelist. Some are called to stand up and speak to thousands. And some are called to stand up and speak to just one. But they are both mighty in the eyes of God. Amen. 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 Let's pray. And so, Father, we come before you now.